Sorry for having been forced to ask you to shorten your coffee break, but bear in mind that it was the, the only way to offer you a decent time for the lunch, because you know how these cascades uh, when attending such a conference. Uh, it is my uh, privilege uh, to uh, chair the second plenary session on substance of this conference. You might have noted that the organizers have opted for an approach which is not a classical one. That is to say that we started by having a discussion, a conversation with you about what I would call the ways and means, the money and the agencies, uh, which are the background which help us to lay the foundation of the development of the policies that we are going to further elaborate upon during the specific and dedicated workshop this afternoon and tomorrow uh, morning. Uh, the agencies are a well-known feature of the Justice and Home Affairs area. At the time, Justice and Home Affairs were a breeding, groom, breeding ground I'm sorry, for agencies which were literally mushrooming. We had the Drugs Observatory in Lisbon, Europol, the CPOL, Frontex, the EASO, the Human Rights Agency, and LISO, and I'm sure that I'm forgetting at least another one. We were looked at with a lot of defiance because of that. Uh, defiance about uh, the autonomy that could be taken over by this agency and therefore the lack of capacity from the Commission side to actually steer them. The lack of accountability, the lack of democratic control. Uh, one of the uh, Vice President of the Commission who was briefly in charge of Justice and Home Affairs, Jacques Barrault, used to refer to the executive director of the agencies en français dans le texte as les proconsuls. Let me just, at this point in time, pay tribute to one of these proconsuls. Bernd, you will not mind, I assume. I would like to have a specific thought for Ilka Leitinen, one of these uh, famous Finn who contribute so much to the development of the Justice and Home Affairs Agenda, the first executive director of Frontex, who could not be with us uh, today. Uh, the initial thinking in creating and further developing agency was based on two needs, trying to meet two needs. The first one was to support the member states in the implementation of new, being de rapidly developed, uh, common policies. That is a very classical feature, by the way, in the way the EU is run. Policies are decided in Brussels, but they are implemented on the ground by member states' national administration. And there is very often, to put it mildly, a gap between the initial decision and the way it is implemented on the ground. The need was felt as the area we were dealing with was so, were so new on the agenda of the EU and so dependent on expertise and capacity present at member states' level to set up these agencies which were meant indeed to help support, coordinate the member states in the implementation of policies. The second uh, goal, the second uh, reason, re raison d'être of this agency was to help and to provide solidarity to support the member states who were a bit lagging behind. You know the famous theory of the weakest link in the chain, and the purpose was precisely to provide the support for those more in need of this uh, support. Now, what the excellent uh, paper that uh, Lian will present us, Evangelia, Lian Tsoldi, will present us uh, immediately after my introduction, what it tends to demonstrate is that maybe at the occasion or as a consequence of the so-called migration crisis known in 2015 and 2016, we might witness nowadays a paradigm shift uh, in the way some agencies, at least the two who are present with us uh, today, uh, have been now uh, moving one gear up and taking over and implementing new tasks, new function, and also all the questions and all the challenges that this imply. Uh, 
when reading the paper, and reading in particular the two paragraphs of the temporary conclusions that are introducing the paper, uh, it came to my mind that maybe I should flag two issues which are surprisingly not directly on the agenda of this conference. The first one, and they are, they are interlinked. The first one is about the visa policy. Very little will be said during this conference about the visa policy. It might be a gap. Uh, I have very strong views and very strong feelings about the visa policy. It needs a fundamental adjournment. We are still implementing in the new millennium an instrument dating back from the 19th century. We are completely underestimating the use that we could make of new technologies. We are still applying a country-based approach to decide whether we deliver, we impose a visa obligation or not. And we are a million light years away to create what should be the next step in the development of the EU apparatus, that is to say, a fully integrated EU consular services, providing consular protection and delivering EU visa in foreign countries. The second missing element is the one of the creation of the databases and the exchange of information. It's huge, it's huge. We could not have dealt with properly in a conference dedicated to migration because it is really at the frontier between migration or flows management, I prefer to say, and law enforcement. It raises a series of fundamental principle issue, data protection and protection of privacy being only one of them, but unfortunately we would not have time to go into the depth of this issue. So please accept the apologies of the organizers. We are keenly aware that these are two gaps, and you might wish, by the way, to fill these gaps during our intervention. Without further ado, I will therefore pass the floor to uh, Lilian Evangelia before uh, listening to our panelists. Please. Thank you, and thank you Jean-Louis de Brouwer for this excellent introduction. Indeed, agencies were not in the scene in the Tampere discussions, but they have since come at the forefront of the EU asylum and external border control policies for these two main reasons. First, as vessels to overcome the policy implementation gap, and second, as vessels to enhance interstate solidarity. And they have seen an immense growth in both their human and financial resources, as well as in their mandates, whether de jure or de facto. So focusing specifically on the European Asylum Support Office and the European Border and Coast Guard Agency that I will commonly refer to as well as Frontex in my intervention, we note two broad trends. Firstly, the operational expansion of their mandates has led to patterns of joint implementation, with own staff and experts deployed by these agencies involved in fields such as return and the processing of asylum claims. The case at point here is Greece, where EASO is involved in decision-making, emitting non-binding opinions in the admissibility and the in-merit uh, stage, while the Greek Asylum Service remains ultimately responsible. Secondly, the expansion of their mandate to include monitoring-like functions. A case at point is the vulnerability assessment conducted by Frontex. So in the note, we identify paths for sustainable developments of increased agency involvement in a way which addresses member states' needs while responding to the challenges of sufficient resourcing, independent accountability, and respect for fundamental rights. And I will focus today on four areas. First is how to balance joint implementation and supervision. So the two limbs of the expanded mandates supervision and operational, they are linked. Structural capacities, structural shortcomings and capacity issues that are identified through the supervision-like processes could then be partially overcome through additional deployment of human and technical resources and launch joint implementation actions. However, there is also an underlying tension, especially if monitoring and supervision will move beyond the purely technical elements. Agencies would then be called at the same time to jointly implement, while they would be also supervising the shortcomings in the implementation of these policies. 
So the note identifies means to address this tension, and I would highlight here one idea, which is the involvement of European Commission staff along the lines of the Schengen evaluation mechanism and the European Parliament in the monitoring processes in order to make it more objective and impartial. The second area of focus is rethinking agencies' governance to ensure their independence. <coughs> So to effectively operationalize their mandate, agencies need to be independent from national interests and political influences. However, at the same time, they are institutionally and functionally dependent on EU institutions and member states. This is exemplified through their internal governance structures, and I'm referring here mainly to the member state-dominated management boards, which have far-reaching functions in planning and operationalizing the agency's mandates. So the basic question which arises here is how could these enhanced functions be reconciled with their internal governance structures? To what extent can their independence be ensured through accountability mechanisms? And here the note identifies a, numbers of, a number of ideas and I will highlight just two. The one is rethinking the composition of agency management boards, for example, through foreseeing a presence for the European Parliament at least as a non-voting member to enhance political scrutiny. And the second is to establish political accountability arrangements before national parliaments, for example, reporting obligations or hearings, and potentially joint parliamentary accountability mechanisms. I'm referring here to a combination of national parliaments and the European Parliament along the lines of Europol. The third area is enhancing European solidarity through agencies. So, by deploying operational personnel, also their own personnel and uh, through member states' administration seconded personnel and equipment, Frontex and EASO enhance the human and financial resources of individual member states, drawing from the EU budget. Initially, agency involvement was linked with the notion of emergency, but it has been decoupled from this emergency-driven uh, logic as portrayed from the move in Frontex to attain uh, its own operational staff, statutory staff. So the note examines if interstate solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility can be meaningfully enhanced. And some ideas are a push for greater augmentation in the number of agency statutory staff and a creation of a standing core also for the EASO um, in the same uh, lines as it has happened uh, for Frontex. My time is coming to a close. It is up. So the, the last point that we can raise also further together was on the fundamental rights uh, challenge where uh, I noted uh, both the existence of judicial and extrajudicial accountability mechanisms and there are uh, specifically some novel uh, processes taking place such as the individual complaints mechanism that has been established in Frontex and here are how I, uh, some ideas in the note on how this could be strengthened and further expanded uh, to other EU agencies. So I give the floor now to our commentators. Okay, thanks a lot, Julian. I, 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 know, I know how frustrating it can be to sum up in a few minutes such a rich paper. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Nina Gregory. She's the executive director of EASO. Uh, we just reminded Nina and myself that, okay, she is also an historical person in the development of the Justice and Home Affairs agenda because she was the first chairperson of the SCIFA coming from a, at that time, so-called new member state, Slovenia. Uh, Nina, the floor is yours. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Jean-Louis. I mean, um, yeah, not to reminiscing the old times, uh, because then it feels, I mean, makes you feel old. But indeed, I, I have to say, yeah, we've, we've come so far, no? Uh, so, uh, distinguished um, uh, chair, of course, panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure, but definitely an honor for me to be here and also to see so many familiar faces. So, that means that our migration world still in a way is a bit small, hopefully, and this might change in years. 
I appreciate, of course, the opportunity to look at how far we have come since Tampere. But of course, as requested, I would rather look in the future. That's, I think, we are here for today. I am personally convinced that on the field of, of asylum policy, we, as the European Union, have made remarkable, remarkable progress, including the adoption of two generations of, of uh, asylum legislation. We've came from minimum to common standards. I think we should note that. And of course, uh, the establishment of European Asylum Support Office in 2010 um, was a part of this framework. But sometimes, as I said, it is good to look back to see how far we have come in 20 years. So, as noted, Mr. Chair, in excellent background paper, um, I think that, especially for this session, I think that, of course, the agencies, such as EASO, have de facto developed beyond the initial interpretation of their mandate, of course, especially when operations grew exponentially following the surge of arrivals of asylum applicants in 2015 and 16. This is today visible through our SOEASO concrete operational support in four um, first-line member states, namely in Greece, in Italy, Malta, and Cyprus. Um, to an extent, in fact, which may not have been foreseeable in Tampere um, uh, 1.0. So I have to say that, of course, the ASO operating in these four member states um, is really, really grown uh, uh, in staff, um, but also, of course, I would say in the resources that we can deliver. So currently, there are almost 1,000 personnel who are working in these four member states under EASO banner. And of course, this has been a huge, a huge progress for us. Um, however, we will still have to say something to reach a um, truly common European asylum system. Why? Across the member states, directives continue to be implemented and interpreted different, differently. Asylum applications are assessed differently. Conditions for reception and treatment of asylum seekers and beneficiaries of protections are in the member states different. So all these differences, all these disparities in the implementation of common European asylum systems sometimes also create, of course, pull and push factors for secondary movements within the EU. Clearly, more convergency in the field of asylum is needed. The migration crisis 2015 and 16 um, very evidently exposed the weaknesses and limitations in the current EU asylum key. Following the lessons learned, efforts have been made at the EU level to develop an effective, sustainable, resilient asylum system. But we are not there yet. And despite the current political negotiations and, of course, the deadlock there, I do not see any other option but to have EASO as asylum agency as essential part of these efforts in the future. And allow me to say, if we are here today, it is because we share the belief that more needs to be done and more can be done. So what else, what else do we need to bring or to do um, as a tr to, to, to reach truly common European asylum system in the future. I think three points here needs to be mentioned. First, further harmonization of legislation, possible codification. Second, clearer rules with less scope for divergent interpretation of them. And thirdly, common binding use of developed tools in practice across EU. But of course, mostly, we have to assure that Europe will get fast and efficient asylum procedures. In order to achieve this, we need a stronger European Union agency for asylum with an extended mandate to meet the demands in the overall common European asylum um, reform. Already, in its work in the, oh my dear God, uh, the time is up. <laughs> We'll conclude in two minutes, if you allow me, Jean-Louis. Thank you very much. So already now, today, EASO is working on its very, very limits. I will give you um, three examples. For example, in Greece, as mentioned, um, 
to get the support of EASO, Greeks need to change their national legislation so that we could be involved in the part of the procedure um, of the asylum. Um, deployment of the member states experts which are working for the agency um, are at current level of only 14%, 1,4%. So how can the agency support the member states if it's heavily dependent on the, the willingness of member states to provide the experts, which of course then go and help the first line member states? And the third challenge that I see, and I think it's also very, very important for the future, is the use of common tools that agency have developed through the years. I'm talking about the common um, uh, information of origin, our guidelines, our, of course, tools that are used to fasten and accelerate the asylum procedure. In this respect, if this in the future would only be guidelines, if this in the future will not be in a way imposed to the member states to use, we will always have convergences in the field of asylum and we will never get through a common or uh, Euro uh, European asylum system. And still, least but not, um, I would say less but not least, as pointed, I would say quite correctly in the papers and also from the side of the distinguished chair, the use of IT technology today, I think we, we are really, really, really poor in this area. Definitely we have huge IT uh, systems in the, in the field of justice and home affairs. But of course, the connection and interoperability amongst them, it's not functioning still. Mm. That's why um, we still in European Union count the asylum procedures, not the people who are in Europe seeking asylum. And with that, of course, I hope I, will, I had um, left a bit of a ground to discuss also further on. Thank you very much. Andrew. No, thank you, Nina. No, no, I mean, uh, you, you've been very clear to the point and thought provoking. That's exactly what is needed precisely to have a good discussion afterwards and to have enough time to have this good discussion. Uh, Bernd, uh, I mean, there, there was no preference between uh, Frontex and EASO, so no duty contest between the two agencies. We know that you are now heading to, uh, I mean, being the commander of an army, uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis, and uh, unfortunately I have to start with an apology. Last week I was traveling overseas and I had to realize a few days ago that apparently I forgot to pack my voice. I arrived back home in Warsaw without my voice. Apologies, usually I do not sound that scary. Uh, dear Chair, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, to keep it short, if we go back to 1999, when the temporary program shaping the EU area of freedom, security, and justice was adopted, I guess very few could imagine how challenging it will be to strike the balance between mobility and security in the fields to come for us. To assess a little bit or to set the scene where we are today, let me give you a few figures. In 2018, airlines globally carry around 1.8 billion international travelers, and this number is expected to reach 3 billion by 2032. Approximately 250 million are residing in a different country than one of their birth, and this is twice the figure that was in 2000. An estimated one-fifth of those migrants are irregular. Some of them already crossed the border without proper documents. According to UNODC, in 2016 alone, 2.5 million migrants were smuggled for economic return of approximately 7 billion US dollars. According to the UN, an estimated 40,000 foreign terrorist fighters may have traveled from more, than, from more than 110 countries to join terrorist groups in Syria and Iraq. That's what we have today. Following this, one could also by no means imagine the importance and rapid growth that EU agencies in this area, such as EASO or the one I'm representing, would experience. In these last 20 years, we have all learned that keeping the Schengen free movement area and ensuring high and common standards in the management of common EU external borders is a difficult and important task, but it is a task that needs 
by all means to be governed by solidarity and common efforts, as it was already mentioned several times. Although, Jean-Louis, you already mentioned it, allow me also to, at this moment, make a small sidestep. I would also like to take the opportunity to pay special tribute here, today in Helsinki, in Finland, in his home country, to the person who set throughout his whole professional life the foundations of the agency I have the honor to represent today in order to become what it is today. I'm talking about Ilka Leitinen, Frontex's first executive director who tragically passed away, passed away and left us far too early. But his legacy, in particular his clear vision and understanding of what European integrated border management needs to be all about, and all of you who have known him, I think, will share my view, will always remain at the core of our agency. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, where do we stand today? Today we are no longer the old Frontex, we are the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. We have a staffing of 720, we have a well-settled headquarters, we have uh, as uh, Nina already said, it also exponentially increased our deployments. Uh, this week we have 1,295 border guards abroad. We are running three annual uh, joint operations in Greece, in Italy and in Spain. We are running the first joint operation outside the EU's borders. We have greatly enhanced our efforts and successes in return. That's where we are. And that's where we already get moving again. The first big step forward was on the 29th of March 2019, when on the basis of the political layer, we managed to uh, uh, adopt the technical operational IBM strategy based on three main objectives, to know what it is before it reaches the border, what needs to be done at the border, and what are the capacities and capabilities to be built for the border. This strategic alignment also governs now our ways on how to move forward in view of the new regulation, the EBCG 2.0 regulation that is foreseen to be uh, uh, coming to effect on the, 20, uh, the 5th of December 2019. And as we speak, the first big issues are already uh, getting into effect in preparation for this. While I was listening to the first panel, I got the notification that the first selection notices for another 750 statutory staff have been published today. So we are again looking for colleagues who are ready and willing to join us to go in the operational field. We have uh, started today a pilot project on fundamental rights monitors together with the Fundamental Rights Agency. We have finalized a training plan and we are in the course of finalizing the long-term strategy for the purchasing of Frontex-owned assets. We will surely come back during our discussion today to all those issues and how this will affect the relationship between the agency and the competent national authorities. Let me nevertheless already underline at this stage that especially this relation is and will be guided more than ever by the principle of partnership, based on mutual trust, solidarity and shared responsibility. This is the only way how we can make the European Border and Coast Guard set out on paper in the EBCG regulation to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Sorry for your voice, but the job offer has been well understood by everybody present in the room. Uh, now, let me pass the floor to our last uh, panelist. And we, I mean, it happens that I don't know Despina, and uh, she, I was really wondering when I saw the program why we thought it was necessary to invite someone from the European banking sector. By the way, I really admire you because you've been spending a couple of hours in the middle of people you don't know, speaking about things that you don't know, using acronyms that you don't understand. I mean, you really deserve a big round of applause only for that purpose. Uh, the reason why... Uh, <laughs> 
the reason why we invited you uh, is not because we were expecting you to provide us with more money, because you are not a lending authority, uh, but because we thought that it was good to look at one of the key issues identified in Lilian's paper, i.e. autonomy and independence, I mean, from a bird's eye, uh, bird's eye view, with someone coming from a completely different world, and see how in your world autonomy, independence, accountability, and control can be combined, so that we could maybe take inspiration from your presentation when looking at the way, as it was presented both uh, by, um, by, by, by Bernd and by Nina, uh, the Justice and Home Affairs agencies are now uh, entering and venturing into completely new areas of their activities. So the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the organizers uh, in general for uh, inviting an outsider to give um, a, a different view. Hopefully this will help you and inspire you. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit uh, knowledgeable about some of the agencies, but not uh, so much in your area. But uh, I, I was uh, coming to this discussion thinking that we are very different, but uh, because we, we are an agency from the area of the old uh, Pillar 1 of, of the EU, so you would expect that um, uh, we have moved uh, very f uh, far ahead uh, from you, but uh, perhaps this is not the case. We have moved earlier than you um, from in the spectrum from um, uh, coordination from minimum coordination to common standards um, but there are still uh, we are still a long way to go um, because I'm coming from a different sector uh, you will allow me a one minute uh, wrap up of um, uh, the financial architecture the architect institutional architecture in a sector there is uh, the EBA the European Banking Authority but there is uh, two also uh, sister authorities ESMA and AOPA ESMA in the Securities and Markets Authority and AOPA in the insurance sector. Um, we were all three created together. Um, our organization represents the different uh, um, subsectors in finance, and it is also a, a bit historically uh, the reason we have developed. One point that I wanted to note is that uh, um, probably different from what happened in your sector, our three authorities uh, were created as a um, as the continuation of three previous committees that existed, and those committees were uh, a spontaneous uh, creation. So it was the member states' uh, competent authorities that um, uh, um, started those committees, and so the, the three ESAs, as we're called, European Supervisory Authorities, we built that on, on that. And you will see why I mentioned this. I think it is important um, in creating a, um, an environment where also member states can have, can feel that trust that also the, uh, the uh, ex-Prime Minister was mentioning this morning. Um, so I was asked to, to focus on those, um, the, uh, on, on uh, the, the two essentially for, uh, questions, first questions that um, Lillian mentioned. Uh, to my mind, these are connected. <clears throat> How can you uh, balance um, what you call joint implementation and supervision and uh, independence of uh, um, uh, agencies? Um, they are connected for the following reason. I was, when I read the first question, as it was said in this excellent background paper, I was a bit uh, perplexed. Um, and the reason is the following, because um, agencies were uh, invented in the United States, and they were invented theoretically as uh, small organizations, which in their small subject matter area uh, uh, apply, let's say, all three kinds of uh, state power. So they help a little bit the legislators complete the regulatory framework, they help a little bit with the execution of the, 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 in the executive power, um, and they help a little bit with adjudication. So um, I'm also an academic, and I, I use this heuristic device uh, to, to explain this to my students. Um, and that's why I, I personally, incurrently, uh, I do, do not see an inherent uh, tension between you know, helping to implement the policies and then judge on the policies. Um, and I, in, in our case, uh, the ESAs and especially the EBA, we have a little bit of this type of, of, uh, of tasks. We, we have something which probably you don't, your uh, agency do not have yet. There are certain areas in the law where we, we help uh, the European Commission draft delegated and implementing acts. Uh, so that is a little bit our quasi-regulatory, uh, let's say, tasks. Um, 
we have a series of um, uh, uh, powers, uh, let's say, or tasks rather, they're not powers, to coordinate uh, the supervision of banks. Uh, do note that the EBA does not supervise directly the banks. Um, in banking, we have a particularity. There is Europeanization of the supervision of banks within the Eurozone since 2014, and that is in the uh, hands of the ECB. Um, so we have a series of uh, um, executive, let's say quasi-executive powers, and we have uh, uh, um, uh, three powers. You can see them in our articles 17, 18, and 19 of our regulation that would be interested, interesting in my colleagues. Um, we have some, what I call quasi-adjudicatory powers. We can mediate between competent authorities if there is uh, disagreements, and we can uh, take a view on a uh, uh, breach of union law where we think there has been a breach of union law in some cases. And the third power, which is so far not used because there is no enabling clause, in, in cases where the Council declares uh, emergency situation in the EU, we can take some uh, decisions. And in these cases, we can take decisions also towards competent authorities and towards um, uh, firms. I see my, my time is up. I will need one more minute just to cover more specifically the independence uh, point. Um, um, I, I got the impression from the background paper that the emphasis on independence is on independence from the member states in the sense of how do you make sure that you are efficient as an agency vis-a-vis -vis, um, a, 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 a plenary organ like in our case it's called the board of supervisors um, in a plenary organ where member states are dominant um, and my my general point and then we can come back a bit more in the, during the discussions my my main point would be that independence, um, uh, in, in, um, in, in the case of an uh, institution that has so many stakeholders, member states, the commission, the other EU institutions, um, the industry, the market, in our case, uh, independence is, cannot be, uh, be seen in silos. It is um, coupled with accountability to different actors because that gives you a system of checks and balances. Um, so one, one important one, one example for that to, which, which came to my mind while the, the colleagues were speaking, um, uh, our chair uh, mentioned um, the importance of information sharing and information gathering. So this, from a lawyer's point of view, my point of view, is a very soft, weak uh, measure and that's how I came into as a, as a naive academic uh, in the beginning of my, of my work at the EBA. I thought these were not important, not so much important. I was um, uh, tools, but because these are at the basis of what the uh, agencies can achieve, they are super important and what impinges on all that, including funding, support uh, for doing some of these uh, operations is, I think, these other operational aspects of uh, supporting the agencies can hugely impinge on their independence uh, also from a member state dominated um, plenary, also from the Commission, from the other EU institutions, so that agencies can carry out their task properly. But we can discuss a bit more later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Espina. You really met our expectation by shedding some lights on the issues which are common and which are certainly coming back during the discussion now. Uh, and I really congratulate our panelists. I know again about the frustration, but you know by being short, you left a series of questions open and you give any, enough space for the discussion and the exchange. We have a good 30 minutes ahead of us uh, for questions and answers. So I will take the questions three by three. So feel free to raise your hand. I see one person there. And the second, and the third one, okay. So the, the, the three first questions are there, okay. So uh, the, the, the ladies, please, can, can you raise your hand so that the lady with the microphone can see you? Yeah, okay. Thank you for giving me the floor. My name is uh, Elena Neocleus. I'm coming from the Ministry of Interior um, uh, of Cyprus. Um, Thank you very much to all panelists for um, their very beneficial contributions. Um, as an introductory remark to my question, please allow me to say that member states, um, especially those in the Mediterranean facing many challenges and uh, pressures on their migration and asylum systems, recognize the necessity of enhanced mandates of the EU agencies, as well as uh, their significant work um, on the ground. Um, my question is addressed to Professor Evangelia Tsurdi and uh, is the following. 
Um, to what extent do you think that the two links um, you mentioned earlier, and that is uh, the operational, as well as the supervisory roles of the agencies in accordance with their uh, mandates, would shift or spill over responsibility to the EU, and that is having especially in mind the EU's autonomy. And the focus of my question is on the European Coast and Board Guard, not so much of EASO, uh, but would be, become relevant, in my opinion, once it becomes an agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I've seen also two hands there, the two ladies sitting next to each other. So, uh, please, there. <laughs> Don't hesitate to raise your hand very high so that our colleagues wearing the microphones do see you. Please Thank go you ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm Cristina Gortaza Rotaice from Pontifical University Comillas of Madrid, and I would uh, like to share with you and ask, especially Mr. Corner, on the agency, uh, the European Border Agency, and some concerns we do have for academics and civil society. For instance, I come from Spain, and, uh, and uh, I would like to share that, as Lillian has said, it is necessary to explain very carefully the differences of the responsibility between some member states and the agency, uh, the European agency, when uh, deciding on very special matters. For instance, I'm going to say only one example because I have many. The Operation Sophia, uh, the communication of March 2019 was that Sophia was stopping with the maritime uh, um, uh, uh, supervise, supervision of, of the Libyan waters, while we receive the news that even because of Sophia has prepared very carefully, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, the, the, the Libyan guardians, uh, the, the number of people trying to cross the central Mediterranean has decreased dramatically, but the people who has uh, died in the, when, it, when trying to cross has increased dram dramatically. I mean, not the total number, but the percentage of people dying has increased in 2018 uh, with regards to 2017, et cetera. It is not a total number, a total figure, but a proportion. And we do want to know if who decided, and especially why? What's the reason? Because I have gone to my ministry webpage, for instance, the Italian one, et cetera, and no answer to such a very astonishing decision. So please. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Ulrike Brandl, University of Salzburg, Austria. I have a small question to Ms. Gregori. Um, you mentioned the uh, member states should uh, amend national legislation in order to give a role to, uh, to EASO or to the agencies in the asylum proceedings. Um, I'm a public international lawyer and European Union lawyer and uh, immediately my question came up how um, I have some concerns with the attributability, uh, accountability, I use the word responsibility and I see we had um, we had experiences with the role of agencies in national proceedings uh, and it was not always a good development. So, and I also heard a UNHCR uh, speaker, high-level UNHCR speaker, I think two or three years ago, and he was very much in favor of an EU, uh, EU role in a, having a uh, supranational decision-making. But uh, obviously, we are not uh, far enough in the moment to have the supranational decision-making. Okay, thank you very much for these three first questions. So in the follow-up order, uh, Lian and then Bern and then Nina, and please prepare the next round of questions. I will come back to you in a while. 
Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, joint implementation does mean greater involvement uh, of, the, of the EU level. It is moving away from the theory of executive federalism, that is, it is up to the member states to implement. It is signaling a passage to what is referred in the literature as an integrated European administration. And it could be, depending on how developments uh, go, a precursor to broader uh, let's say changes and shifts into the implementation modes of, of these uh, policies. So indeed more, more and more increasing involvements, if you will, uh, of the EU level. Of course there are some uh, political limits and there are some constitutional limits which I which I raise in the in the in the background note to how far uh, we can we can go in this uh, direction on the basis of current both secondary and and primary EU law and does it mean uh, greater involvement? Yes. And does it mean also responsibility in the sense of liability? Uh, yes, of course. The more uh, the EU level is involved and comes into direct interaction with individual asylum uh, seekers and migrants, the issue of liability and joint liability also for violations of, of human rights arises. Thank you, Bernd. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, allow me to s slice it a bit because there are certain things that need to be clarified. Uh, Unaformed Sophia operation is not a uh, European border and coast guard operation. So in whether we run an operation or we do not run an, uh, this operation, the agency I'm representing had no influence on. There is a cross uh, information exchange via liaison officers. We had the liaison officer posted in the past at the Unaformed Sophia flagship and the Unaformed Sophia uh, liaison officer was in our premises. But apart from that, we do not have any influence on whether this, uh, this operation is being run or not. This has been decided uh, by other uh, uh, entities that are not uh, in any case uh, linked to us. The operation we are running is the operation Temis, joint operation Temis, which in accordance with Italy has an operational area and has uh, an operational tasks agreed with Italy uh, when before the operation Temis went into force. In case of calls of distress, the task for search and rescue operations is Unfortunately, again, not with us, and this is a currently ongoing discussion also within the European Parliament, because this needs to be enforced. It is the maritime rescue coordination centers of the respective countries that have to launch those operations, and we have the strict order to immediately summon ourselves under the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center if we are the next vessel uh, in, in the reach of a possible call of distress. I'm fully with you that the number of casualties needs to be reduced and not in percentages or in relations, but in overall figures. But there is unfortunately still a lot to be done in this field because here the field of work is still huge. Thank you. Nina. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think maybe I should just explain, as, as, as Bern did, uh, just to, to do, maybe I was wrongly understood, but uh, in fact the, the case of, of, of uh, changing of uh, domestic legislation was also very good described in the, in the, the background documents, uh, that's why I refer to it, because it's very, very much linked to our current mandate, and the question for the future is, where we, do we go with the mandate of asylum agency? But just to be very clear and, and I would say plain. Of course, these uh, changes of uh, the legislation in Greece um, were there to ease the administration procedure in Greece, not to, of course, um, give the powers to EASO to decide upon the Greek authorities. So this has to be clear. Of course, we help them, we support with certain part of the procedures, but of course, we don't decide in asylum cases in any any member states, of course, in Europe. So this, I think, it's it's the basis. But when we 
answer to this question, then of course the question immediately arises, how in the future the mandate of the agency is going to be um, defined. We've seen the negotiations, uh, the political negotiations for the new mandate of the new European Asylum Agency. And of course this question was posed, but not, I would say, um, loudly. And I would say broadly, and also not, uh, I don't think it would be received or perceived uh, with, with great uh, generosity from the side of the member states. I do understand that, of course, they want to, I would say, stick their with their national competences and their, their so sovereignty. So that's, I would say, it's a qu but it is the question for the future. So we go further the lane. Should we give the powers, executive powers to the agencies, and how? Far can we go? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I will now take. Yes, Bernd, Bernd okay, please, and Despina uh, also, please comment. Uh, I, I will not hide, uh, and that's the reason why I asked to come in immediately after Nina, because this is a question that already has uh, gained in importance for us. I mentioned in my brief introductory uh, speech that we are currently running the first uh, uh, joint operation outside the EU external borders in Albania. And our new mandate will bring us, for the statutory staff, executive powers. And also this, I very openly admit, is work in progress. Because if we look at the executive powers and the question of accountability and implementation, there are several different strands that need to be thought of. Uh, you have category one, statutory staff belonging to us, category two, long-term deployments from the member states, category three, short-term deployments from the member states. How do they fit together? How will they work together? And if we then take, let's say, uh, the example of a refusal of entry, and this refusal of entry is challenged, how is it being challenged? Uh, has the person that has been refused entry the right to appeal, and if so, where and how? So also here, the pure granting of executive powers has been a very interesting and a very challenging uh, uh, move forward. But as one colleague once said it back home, uh, in, in this area we are a little bit sailing in uncharted waters. Because we need, together with the member states, also then to find out what if. What if somebody refuses entry and how can this be then challenged or appealed according to the legal remedies that have to be given to the person uh, in all cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Despina, please. Uh, sorry, there's so much to say about all <coughs> this uh, that there's so little time. So I, I wanted to take this chance, yes, um, to make some comments uh, on the point of the accountability and the point of um, uh, you, that Nina was discussing about getting more uh, powers. I mentioned before about ESMA, our sister authority, the Securities and Markets Authority, and I wanted to emphasize that we don't we don't supervise banks at the national. Uh, this is a national and ECB um, um, competence, but ESMA do supervise directly. This is an agency that has direct supervisory powers towards some market participants. It's uh, credit rating agencies and trade depositories. They are very important infrastructure in the financial infrastructure. They're very important um, uh, um, uh, actors. And so we have an example of an agency that has gotten these um, European powers. It has, where, the, where it has been completely Europeanized, the power to take decision making. We've had the case, and also ESMA already had the case of short selling, perhaps those of you who are uh, following the agency law in the EU, there, there was uh, a long time Meroni doctrine, the Meroni uh, jurisprudence that essentially was limiting the powers of the agencies and is still in a way applicable, but it has been sort of clarified via the short selling uh, decision that agencies can take um, decisions. Um, the, the, the difference is they shouldn't, they cannot take really policy decisions. So that brings me to the counter side of this, um, giving more powers to agencies, but the, the other side of the coin of that is accountability. And there are a huge, I mean, I have slides from some presentations I did recently. It would take me a whole day, perhaps a whole week to cover all of these accountability mechanisms, but there are, there are there are inner governance, something that can inspire you. We have stakeholder groups that are part of our agencies. I'm not sure whether this is possible in, in your cases, but we have um, um, a subcommittee of the ESAs. Each of the ESAs has a committee of stakeholder groups. So in our case, industry and consumers and academics who give input to the 
um, to the work of the agency. Um, but we have um, a, a series of accountability mechanisms towards uh, the European institutions as well. And this, this brings me to another point that I wanted to make a comment on um, uh, the background paper a proposal, I mean, uh, something that uh, I understand you're, you're discussing, the possibility of having um, uh, uh, commission and parliament uh, representatives in the work of the agencies when you are doing the joint implementation. Um, the view from our uh, experience is that um, this hasn't, um, I think it hasn't even been proposed actually in, in our sector, but it hasn't gone, it hasn't gained traction, probably because of some sectoral differences. Um, you cannot have the Parliament and the Commission involved in um, uh, decisions that uh, relate to also some market participants, you know, specific banks. There are, there are reasons of confidentiality, there are issues of um, conflicts of interest. So. Um, Alternative ways that perhaps this is this is my contribution that perhaps could be useful to be considered also in this area. What uh, we have in a new proposal for the ESAs, um, um, the, the ESAs uh, uh, regulations are being reviewed again, and the new uh, regulations will probably uh, enter into force in January. So one of them mechanisms I find interesting is an, an increased transparency towards the European Parliament. There is a now a specific article. Um, I was reading it before, so I have to put on my glasses. Uh, I think it's the 43A in our regulation. It's a, it's a new article that provides that um, after each board of supervisors um, uh, a meeting, we should be sharing the conclusions with the parliament, except um, the decisions relating to specific financial institutions, banks um, you know, and other companies. So perhaps, I mean, these are uh, seen perhaps softer ways um, to, uh, to influence um, of accountability, but they are very, um, they are the more, in, in our case, uh, they're the only ones to, to ensure the um, uh, more direct uh, influence of EU institutions on our work. I hope this helps. Thank you very much. So still 15 minutes to go before the end of the session. I see hands there. One, two, three questions. I will come back to you afterwards. Okay, so the gentleman on the last row there, and then we'll go down. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Adolfo Zomarivas from EMN Luxembourg. I have a question for Mr. Corner. And uh, my main concern is in the accountability for EASO. EASO is becoming actually a, a, an agency that is becoming a military force at the end of the day. If I compare it to the American Coast Guard, is is the last unit. But right now you have been uh, Normally, your staff you recruited from pol law enforcement agencies from the member states that goes on deployment for five years. So the problem is this: this uh, this disrupts some of the work they do in their national uh, in their national countries because they they get to another in another context. So for example, you get a specialist of document fraud and put the, uh, place them to work in the borders, but when they have to come back, for example, to Spain, they have lost their track in their national competence. So my question is, in, in the first question is, is as a Frontex try, uh, will establish its own recruiting mechanisms to have their own uh, staff and not depending always in the member states because it, even though it's a great experience for certain uh, uh, police officers, at the same time it creates a, a deficiency in, the, in their national member states. And the second one is do you create uh, how you will handle misman uh, internal affairs with who handles these issues if there is uh, uh, an issue with a, a police officer of an ex-member state in the territory of another member state or abroad? Who will do the, the accountability in relationship to uh, the, the, the third party? Thank you very much. So I had seen two hands there, please. And then Mr. Thank you, Francesco Maiani, University of Lausanne. Uh, 
Lillian said something uh, important right now. She said, with more operational responsibility comes more accountability. And um, there is now a discussion ongoing, at least the idea has been floated to, for instance, entrust EASO with tasks such as determining which member state will be responsible for an asylum seeker. And if you work out the implication, this means that the EASO will make a determination on legal criteria which are amenable to litigation. We'll have to perhaps, depending on how its power are configured, order detention of persons. The point I'm driving at is the more you give powers, the more you need a court mm -hmm. to oversee the exercise of those powers. Now, by default, the court that checks the exercise of powers of EU bodies is the CGEU. And the question is, is the CGEU equipped for mass litigation? In my view, it's not. So are we also thinking, when we think about the trend of more operational responsibilities being given to agencies, do we also think of adjustments to the EU judicial architecture that might be necessary? Okay, and then the gentleman on the second row. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Mario Savino from the University of Viterbo, Italy. Uh, as an administrative law scholar, I found your paper, Lillian, very, very interesting, brilliant, forward-looking. I have two questions. One really is related to independence and the other to uh, accountability. The first is, do we really want all these agencies to become independent and, and by whom? Uh, Second point is uh, related to, to accountability. Uh, I think there is a need to differentiate between the different kinds of activities uh, that these agencies perform. Otherwise, we cannot find the, the proper model to make these account uh, activities accountable. So I think there is a need also to go back to the basics and you know, to draw on the ex extend the literature we have on, on the national uh, level. We, we deal with agencies as, as administrative law scholars, we deal with agencies, uh, independent regulatory commissions, so we can find the proper model. Of course, we have to adjust it to the specificities of the EU level, but still we need to differentiate between rulemaking, adjudication, operational and implementation level and find the right balance. Okay, so I propose the follow-up order. Bernd, you would start, then we will move to Lilian, then Nina, and I'm sure that Bernd and Despina would like also to come back to the last questions, which were of a horizontal nature. But Bernd, you, you would chip in first. Thank you very much. Uh, let me, at the beginning, make something uh, very clear. Uh, uh, w w we are by no means intending uh, to have something established like a military force. Just to make that uh, very clear. Uh, uh, as regards the process that you were referring to, let me uh, start with the fact that the current business model, as we call it, has apparently reached its upper limits. Because for many years we were uh, relying on the pooling of resources and us being the ones who always gathered the deployments, uh, grouped them and then sent them out uh, did the administrative work and looked that they, they would come back. Before the migration crisis, we had roughly 300 per week out. Last year, we have reached for the first time 1,800. As regards uh, human resources, meaning border guards, uh, men and women, um, this was still working, but as regards technical assets, we were already coming to the upper level that was uh, resulting more and more in gaps. So we needed to revert somehow the approach. Before the EBCG 2.0 came up, we already had the uh, long-term strategy for the purchasing of Frontex own assets uh, adopted in the management board with the goal until 2027 to reverse the approach, saying that until 2027, the agency would be capable to have its own assets in the broad sense by themselves. Release the member states who were increasingly telling us we can no longer because we need it ourselves. So this was somehow an organic uh, uh, development that now ended up in the provisions of the uh, EBCG 2.0. Uh, this is a long-term process. 
So this is not something that will happen overnight, uh, but we have successfully kicked it off, as I said in my opening statement, with the first uh, publishing of selection notices, where we in fact started our own recruitment process. This own recruitment process was developed together with the member states, on the basis of the examples of member states, and several member states have taken over shares because we are st simply not capable uh, to perform certain checks because we do not have the resources. We do not have the experience and we are not able uh, to have those valid parts of the recruitment processes done by ourselves. This is now the first test bed that is running, the 750. They will be uh, recruited and we hope that we have a provisional result until the end of the year, because in order to have the first deployments ready by 1st of January 2021, we need for the selection process the first semester of 2020, then for the training, so that we are, according to the timeline that we have set up together with Commission, ready to deploy when we expect it to be ready for, to deploy. As regards uh, the issue uh, of um, responsibility and accountability, in case something happens, the last part of your question. We've already now had a clear-cut and very uh, straightforward reporting system in place where everybody, after having undergone the necessary pre-deployment training, was obliged to immediately follow up with whatever happened. Shall it be a forest fire? Shall it be a traffic accident? Shall it be a, a, a possible infringement of fundamental rights? Shall it be whatever you can imagine? We have classified that and we have special follow-up procedures in place for the serious incident reports that we get. And those serious incident reports, if you look already in today's regulation, have a certain escalation procedure, which can be additional training at the bottom level to uh, calling back to cancelling an operation. This will, of course, remain. The addressees might change. Because in one case, it was as an addressee, a member of a, mem a border guard of a member state who was deployed, uh, and he might have been the addressee, then it was the member state as the one employing him. If it will be us employing him, you can take the answer out of what I just said before. Thank you. Okay. Jan? <coughs> so on the independence question, I, I do not mean that uh, there won't be any more functional interdependence between uh, the agencies and the EU institutions or the member states through the management board. So there is no proposal to uh, have management boards that won't be composed uh, of, of uh, member states. But the issue is that Given this setting, what other accountability arrangements can we have in order to counterbalance or to, to ensure independence and quality in the products that these agencies uh, should have as an output? For example, EASO is to have this country of origin information common positions where the management board will also be pivotal in uh, endorsing uh, these, these positions. So we have to make sure that there are some checks and balances so, so that we'll ensure also the quality of these uh, outputs that then will be used uh, throughout the EU because we are going towards also more harmonization, if you want, bottom up uh, from, from the agencies. And Francesco, I'm thinking of this question exactly uh, right now. So yes, the broader question, the policy question uh, of what could we do uh, when, if this is to get uh, before the, the CJU, I'm even thinking a step before, could these preparatory acts at national level, because this is what they are, uh, are they amenable even uh, to review before the Court of Justice? And I'm not referring to the fact that, of course, a national court can ask a reference for a preliminary ruling. Are they per se amenable to review? I'm reading Advocate General Bobek these days. I will, I will come back to you. 
Okay, uh, let me just before I pass the floor to Nina and Despina, uh, we are getting near to the end of this session and I don't want to frustrate the lady in red. I know that you still have a question uh, coming. Uh, no, 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 no I, I did not forget you, so I will ask uh, the panelists to be very to the point, as they have been until now, in their answer, then pass through the floor and you will have the last word and the last question. Okay. Uh, no, Nina, Nina, um, Nina, Nina. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you very much, and we, no, um, uh, I can't, I can't go, uh, and I can't pass by the, the, the point that you raised about the country of origin information, but also in the, in the documents. I have to point out here that this, of course, it's, it is an EASO exercise, but all the member states are involved in the work of network together with UNHCR and EASO when we prepare those documents. So already the, at the initial stage, the member states are there as actors, so it's, it's it's under the label of EASO, but they are involved at the beginning. So just to, as an explanation, because I think it's very important. When we talk about the, the question about the, the appeal and judiciary, uh, this is my favorite one. Uh, because why? Now, when we talk about the procedures currently, of course, they are in the domain of member states. This will stay. So I think you asking more for the future, if I understood. All right, very good. Yeah, because there's no determination of which member state is responsible for the uh, application from the side of EASO. This does not happen, no? It's the member states who is in charge of that. We only support. But the question of the judiciary already now is very pending and important. If we take a look at the future view, um, I will build upon numbers now. So that maybe, you know, this is a truth uh, to, to think also from the side of theory, not only practice. To Two important points. First, uh, very no data. We have currently in European Union 900,000 asylum applications, uh, applicants waiting for their decision. So that means half of this pending cases is in the hands of a member states authority. Uh, so administrative procedure, half of them waiting for the appeal, so the ju in the hands of the ju judiciary. From my perspective, from the perspective of my agency, under the current mandate, we, of course, conduct the training and the professional development for the administrative uh, uh, part, and we do involve, but very, with very limited mandate, also to courts and tribunal, to tribunals to invite them to use our tools, to invite them in the dialogue to be, I would say, involved. Why this is important? Because the convergency in the asylum procedures will never come if this is not going to be aligned. So here, I think that for the future, of course, it's very, very important how the judiciary will decide, because this will always stay in the, in the hands of the member states. And second point, um, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, the, the question of, of course, uh, the future, I would say, uh, convergence uh, in matter, if, can we go f further than today? My belief is yes, definitely, definitely, but only with the notion that each and every part of the procedure needs to be discussed when we talk about the new mandate and possibility of, of changing that. Thank you. Despina? Yeah, I will be also very quick um, to, to uh, start from the last question of the colleague from Viterbo. Um, that's, that's exactly what I meant earlier. There is a panorama of, uh, of um, accountability mechanisms that are not called as such necessarily, but uh, um, uh, when I mentioned these quasi-regulatory tasks that we have, we, we assist, we complete, uh, we assist the, the Commission in adopting, delegating, implementing acts. We only um, a system, so it is the Commission that takes a decision, not the EBA. Uh, and secondly, when we, uh, in those regulatory, let's say, tasks, we uh, have obligations established in our regulation um, to consult, to do impact assessment, and to consult also with that uh, stakeholder group, which is internal to the uh, EBA. Um, when we are doing the other quasi-executive uh, things that I was mentioning, I, I mean, I, this is a, a, a breadth of, uh, of tools also, there are peer reviews, so it is the uh, competent authorities together with EBA staff that go to other competent authorities to see how they have, they have applied either legislation or EBA guidelines and recommendations or other soft law measures. In, in those cases, if we, and in the adjudicatory cases where uh, we can exceptionally, very rarely, take decisions that affect directly competent authorities or directly institutions like banks, um, uh, we have all uh, and this links to the other question from the colleague from Lausanne, um, we have uh, all of them 
obligations uh, uh, to give the right to be heard. The, the procedural uh, rights are all there. And something that could be of inspiration for, for your question on how to deal with uh, future litigation um, uh, flooding, um, what um, is common to the three ESAs um, is a strange um, uh, scheme, but it is uh, it is working. It is called the Board of Appeal. This is a, um, a, a body that is common to the three ESAs. It is supposed to be part of the three ESAs, the three authorities, but it is the first point, let's say the, the first uh, place where somebody can bring um, a complaint or against the decision of the of the ESAs, and that filters through. Um, uh, decision and that goes um, also for um, ESMA, like I mentioned before, who have direct uh, uh, supervision of uh, certain uh, actors. There have been board of appeal cases against those decisions. It was about some fines that uh, ESMA gave to uh, credit rating agencies, I think, last year. So it goes first to the board of appeal, and then, of course, there is uh, the possibility to also go to the uh, European Court of Justice. Thank you very much. So, please, you have the last question. Thank you very much. Uh, Nina Murray from the European Network on statelessness. I'm very grateful to be given the last word. Thank you. Um, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees this morning noted the importance of addressing statelessness within policy responses to migration and asylum in Europe. And um, perhaps here we are with the last word. It's an issue that's often invisible in the debate. So I'm grateful to be given the visibility. Um, how My question was to Ms. Gregory and Mr. Kerner. What opportunities do you see in the work of your agencies for addressing mainstreaming the issue of statelessness across your work in, in the future. And I guess how can we as civil society support that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bernd and then Nina. Th thank you very much for this question. Um, ironically, um, this has been part of a discussion uh, two days ago between the chair of the consultative forum uh, and ourselves on how we can especially and precisely address this. Uh, we have had a uh, first meeting already uh, uh, to find common ways forward on how to address it in the screening, debriefing and interviewing. Uh, we have to uh, better uh, address it in the training scheme. We have to better address it in the collection of statistical data because for the time being, statelessness is an issue that has been not really that sufficiently taken care of. But it is a, a question that we are, and we have the meeting on the 29th and the 30th of October, that we are going to devote special attention to, uh, to uh, brainstorm on measures and to agree on measures and how we can especially enhance that. Thank you. Nina? So I will be quite short. I can I can just um, join Bernd uh, with saying that, of course, this has never been maybe um, addressed uh, uh, from the side of EASA, for sure not, uh, I would say, in a specific way. We have, of course, dedicated um, groups uh, which work on dedicated, I would say, thematic approaches, like, you know, uh, work with the uh, uncombining minors, work with uh, vulnerable people, workers. but it says in, in, in its essence, as you pointed out, has never been really addressed in this in these situations. Of course, the member states when they decide upon the asylum. In this respect, of course, they have the, uh, I would say, the, it's the guidelines and they, they, they do um, have that, I mean, special things in the, 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 in the national law. But uh, from side of our agency to be addressed in a the, in the thematic uh, manner, we haven't uh, done yet. Uh, maybe it should, it should be time uh, to think about that too. But then usually what we do with the thematic things is always we approach the member states, listen to their requests in the sense of the... Um, addressing the situations. So in this respect, I can raise this up also from myself. Thanks for the question. So you see, indeed, your question was quite timely. Uh, so uh, this brings this session to a close. Uh, before passing the floor to our Master of Ceremony, uh, Kielo, uh, I just want to uh, express our warm thanks, not only to Lilian, but also to the panelists. Uh, because what we get out of this section was exactly, by the way, what we got of the previous one. That is to say, you were very bold, transparent. I mean, this is not Chatham House rules, but okay, you were quite open about also looking at the future. And that's a little, I, I think that's a little bit the expectations of 
both the EPC, uh, the Odysseus Network, and beyond them, the Finnish presidency, is that we come out of this conference with a series of palatable recommendations and orientation for either the very near future or the mid to long term, the discussion about accountability and independence. Okay, it might not be tomorrow. You said it, Nina, yourself. I mean, uh, taking two bold steps might be rejected by some member states, but we know that it is on the horizon and that it could come much earlier than expected. Nobody would have never known that, for instance, Frontex would have become the EB. EB. I remember the endless discussion the, the 2008 pact should we mentioned the European Border Guard Corps. It's there now. So uh, you know that sometimes history is accelerating things much more than we thought, and therefore it's good that we are ready with these kind of thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Kielo. Guide us through the, ne the, ne the end of the morning.